Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this further education lecture on marine biology. Today we are going to look at the coelacanth. The discovery of the coelacanth has been compared to finding a dinosaur walking around today over 85 million years after it went extinct. The story began a few days before Christmas in 1938 when the first living coelacanth was discovered off the east coast of South Africa at the mouth of the Kolumna River. The fish was caught in a shark gill net by Captain Goosen and his crew who, recognizing the bizarre nature of their catch, alerted the local museum in the small South African town of East London. The director of the East London Museum at the time was Miss Marjorie Courtney Latimer, after whom the coelacanth was eventually named. Miss Courtney Latimer offered bounties to fishermen for unfamiliar fish. It was Miss Courtney Latimer who alerted the prominent South African XI Dr. J.L.B. Smith, who initially identified the fish and subsequently informed the world about this amazing discovery. This first coelacanth led to the discovery of the first documented population off the remote Comoros Islands, between the mainland of Africa and Madagascar. For 60 years, this was presumed to be the only coelacanth population in existence. Originally, it was a concern that the coelacanth might have a very limited range and that overfishing along the Comoros Islands might wipe it out. However, scientists were amazed when, on July 30, 1998, an American scientist discovered a coelacanth population in Indonesia. Dr. Mark Erdman was on a honeymoon trip to the area investigating a coral reef research site when he spotted a strange fish being wheeled into the fish market. He recognized the fish as a coelacanth and snapped a picture before it was sold. Dr. Erdman's subsequent research revealed that the people from Sulawesi had a name for it, Raja, King of the Sea. The Sulawesi coelacanth colony is about 10,000 kilometers east of where the coelacanths were previously known to occur in the western Indian Ocean. Both Sulawesi and Comoros coelacanths are quite different from all other living fish. But perhaps the most interesting feature of the coelacanth is that it is paired, lobed fins, which move similarly to our arms and legs. Coelacanths also have an extra lobe on their tail and a vertebral column that is not fully developed. They are the only living animal to have a fully functional intracranial joint, a division that separates the ear and brain from the nasal organs and eye, and allows the front part of the head to be lifted when the fish is feeding. The brown Sulawesi coelacanth and the steel blue Comoros shared share these unusual characteristics. The discovery of the coelacanth in 1938 is still considered to be the zoological find of the century. This living fossil comes from a lineage of fish that was thought to have been extinct since the time of the dinosaurs. Coelacanths are known from the fossil record dating back over 360 million years and peaked in abundance about 240 million years ago. Before 1938, they were believed to have become extinct approximately 80 million years ago, after mysteriously disappearing from the fossil record. How could the coelacanth disappear for over 80 million years and then turn up alive and well in the 20th century? The answer seems to be that fossil coelacanths appeared to live in environments with clay sedimentation with plenty of volcanic activity. Modern coelacanths both in the Comoros and Sulawesi inhabit caves and overhangs in vertical marine reefs, at about 200 meters, environments not conducive to fossil creation. In 1991 scientists got a better understanding of the fish when Comoros got their independence from France and French restrictions on research were lifted. This allowed scientists to study the fish off the Comoros Islands. As the animal hides in underwater caves some 300 to 700 feet down during the day and comes out at night to feed, diving is not an option and previously only fishermen specimens had been available for study. But this time, the scientists had their submarine so they could study the coelacanth in its natural habitat through portholes. Good evening, everyone. As you know, this is our last meeting before we set off on our annual week-long hiking trip. So tonight I'll be telling you everything you'll need to know to be ready for the trip. Let's talk about equipment first. 
Having the right equipment is essential for your comfort and safety. First, you'll need a warm and comfortable sleeping bag. However, you won't need to worry about carrying a tent since we'll be sleeping in shelters along the way. Also, part of the fee you've paid for the trip goes toward food, so you won't need to put that on your packing list either. We've found, though, that it's more efficient for each person to bring his or her dishes, so be sure to pack a plastic bowl, a cup, and a fork, knife, and spoon. That's all you'll need in the way of dishes. Perhaps the most important item to put on your list is a comfortable pair of hiking boots. Nothing ruins a hike more than getting blisters and sores from ill-fitting boots. So make sure your boots fit you right. Shoes and sneakers aren't adequate for the type of hiking we'll be doing. Of course, a backpack is necessary for carrying your equipment. Make sure you have one that's lightweight and comfortable to carry. Walking poles have become popular among hikers recently, but we don't recommend them. They can get in the way when too many hikers are using them at once, and some serious injuries have been caused. So it's best to leave those at home. Let's see, what else? Oh, yes. Some people have asked me about trail maps. They're available, but you don't need them, as your hike leaders have scouted out the trail and will be guiding you along the way. And don't forget to bring a warm jacket. You may think you won't need one in this warm summer weather, but remember that evening in the mountains can get quite cold. Is there anything else I need to tell you? Oh, yes, your guides will each be carrying a first aid kit, so that's one less thing for you to pack yourself. Remember, you'll be carrying your backpack all day, so keep your load light and don't overpack. I know you're all experienced hikers, but it's always worth repeating the rules of the trail since they're so important. These rules are in place for the safety of everyone on the trip. As you know, there will be a hike leader walking at the head of the line, who will show the group the way. At the end of the line will be the rear leader or sweep. It's important to always stay ahead of this person while we're on the trail. There are several different trails on the mountain where we'll be hiking, and they cross each other at some points. When you come to an intersection of trails, stop and wait for the rest of the group to catch up. This way we can be sure that no one goes off on the wrong trail. Let me emphasize here how important it is to stay on the trail. We'll be climbing through some steep and rocky areas. Don't be tempted to go off on your own and try to climb some rocks. That can be quite dangerous. Also, it's not likely, but we may encounter some large wild animals along the way. The last thing you want to do is try to feed any of them. That will just encourage them to follow us, which could lead to some dangerous situations. One last thing, before we set off hiking each morning, be sure to fill up your water bottle. This is perhaps the most important safety rule. Dehydration can be a serious problem when you're out in the wilderness, so you must always be sure to carry an adequate supply of water with you. I think that covers just about everything. Are there any questions? An understanding of customer psychology is an invaluable aid for retailers looking for ways to increase sales. Much can be done to the store environment to encourage shoppers to linger longer and spend more money. The first aspect to consider is the physical organization of the store. The placement of merchandise has a great deal of influence on what customers buy. For example, a common practice among retailers is to place the store's best-selling merchandise near the back of the store. To get to these popular items from the front entrance, customers have to walk down aisles filled with merchandise that they might not see otherwise. Carpets are also used to direct customers through particular areas of the store. Retailers choose carpets not only for their decorative or comfort value, 
but also because lines or other types of patterns in the carpets can subtly guide shoppers in certain directions. Besides encouraging shoppers to go to certain areas of the store, retailers also want to keep them in the store longer. One way to do this is to provide comfortable seating throughout the store, but not too close to the doors. This gives customers a chance to rest and then continue shopping. Retailers can do several things to create a pleasant atmosphere in the store, thereby encouraging more purchases. Music is commonly used, not as entertainment, but as a calming influence. It can slow the customer's pace through the store, making them spend more time shopping and, consequentially, making more purchases. Scents are also used in various ways. Everyone has had the experience of being drawn into a bakery by the smell of fresh bread. Experiments have been done with other types of sensors as well. For example, the scent of vanilla has been used to increase sales in clothing stores. The use of color is another important aspect of the store environment. Certain colors can affect behavior as well as mood. Light purple, for example, has been found to have an interesting effect on customer behavior. People shopping in an environment where light purple is the predominant color seem to spend money more than shoppers in other environments. Orange is a color that's often used in fast food restaurants. It encourages customers to leave faster, making room for the next group of diners. Blue, on the other hand, is a calming color. It gives customers a sense of security, so it's a good color for any business to use. In addition to using color to create mood and affect customer behavior, color can also be used to attract certain kinds of customers to a business. Stores that cater to a younger clientele should use bold, bright colors, which tend to be attractive to younger people. Stores that are interested in attracting an older clientele will have more success with soft, subtle colors, as older people find these colors more appealing. This afternoon we'll visit the city's shopping district. Several blocks in the area are close to car traffic, and I know you'll enjoy walking around there. I'd like to give you an overview of the district now since you'll be on your own once we get there. You'll see on this map here that the shopping district consists of two streets, Pear Street, which runs north and south, and Cherry Street, which crosses Pear Street right here. Let's start our tour here on Pear Street where the star is. This star marks the Harborview Bookstore. It's very popular among locals as well as tourists. You can buy a range of books of local interest as well as a variety of magazines and newspapers. It's directly across the street from the city library, which is also worth a visit. It's in one of the oldest buildings in the city and contains, among other things, an interesting collection of rare books. Now, moving up Pear from the bookstore toward Cherry, the next building on the left is the Pear Cafe. You'll notice it's right on the corner of Pear and Cherry Streets. It's a great place to relax while enjoying a delicious cup of coffee or tea. You can talk with friends or read quietly. They have a variety of books and magazines available. From the windows of the cafe, you can look right across Cherry Street for a lovely view of city gardens. It's a rather small garden, but it contains a variety of exotic plants and flowers. Let's leave the cafe and cross Pear Street. On the opposite corner, we're at Caldwell's Clothing Store, which you might also want to visit. They sell both men's and women's fashions from countries around the world. Continuing down Cherry Street, the next building on the right after Caldwell's is the Souvenir Shop. Stop in here to get maps and books about the local area, as well as t-shirts and postcards with pictures of the city. Now, we cross Cherry Street and we're at the Art Gallery, one building down from the corner. 
Here you can see and, of course, purchase many fine paintings and sculptures by local artists. Let's keep going down Cherry Street toward the harbor. On the left, right after the gallery, is Harbor Park. It's a lovely place, and it's certainly worth spending some time there. Harbor Park was built on land donated to the city by Captain Jones, a lifelong resident of this city. Captain Jones designed the park himself, and it was built in 1876. Exactly in the center of the park a statue of Captain Jones was erected, and it's still standing there today. It shows Captain Jones on the bow of his ship. After viewing the statue, you can follow the path that goes through the woods just behind. It will lead you to a lovely garden, in the middle of which is a fountain. This is a nice place to enjoy a few quiet moments. If you still feel like walking, continue on to the far end of the garden. There, you'll find a wooden staircase, which will take you down to the harbor. You might enjoy the view of the boats from there. There's also a walking path along the water, which will eventually bring you back up to Cherry Street. You can see that there's plenty to do in this part of the city. The bus leaves at 1.30.